I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to the Unashamed Podcast. I feel like we're the dust has settled. We're back to normal. Uh, Zach's back in North Carolina. Uh, welcome, yeah. Zach. And you just got there, right, today. Yeah, So it's been crazy because it was a couple of days ago we had uh, – King and Cunt for King and Country and Rebecca St. James. The small bones were here. They left a note behind Jay. This is right here on the table when I got here. Phil, Jay, Al, and Zach, thank you so much for having us on Unashamed. We're not only grateful, but so inspired by your family. Many thanks. Mm. So just a reminder, just that was a kind of a whirlwind day because they were doing our podcast. They did the Duck Call Room. They also did uh, Sadie's. Did they do it's Sadie's? Called, it's called the, uh, the Robertson Gauntlet. That's what that is. The you gauntlet. Can, yeah, they, well, came, they came through the Robertson gauntlet. But yeah. they seem pretty excited about as excited about meeting us as we were about meeting them. I mean, it seemed that way. Well, I just said they may get back and say those people. I'll never go back to Louisiana <laughs> <laughs> ever no, again. No, well, I have breaking news. Oh, breaking news. Hang on, hang on. Okay. Now it's three clicks. <laughs> so after they left, we exchanged numbers and. Cause I'm gonna tell you, I told y'all before we got started today. I it was, I was impressed with those that group of people and that family more than anybody else I've ever met in my life in that short a time. I mean, they they love the Lord, and so and look, we, I'll tell this because this happened off camera and we didn't mention it. But before we got started, um, I think you brought up that we had had the previous podcast Lisa was on, and we were her. She was sharing about her finding out about breast cancer. Well, Joel was like, ho, 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 hey, let's 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 stop and pray mm-hmm. about this right now. We called Lisa over and, I mean, and prayed for us and our families, so, which right off the bat, I'm like, okay, these these guys got my attention. You know, I mean, they're concerned enough about us to do that. So, yes, yeah. I, I could not agree more. Well, and uh, Rebecca said a prayer before the Duck Call Room podcast, which when you think about it, if you're doing a podcast – with Sai, you never know where that's going to go, and so maybe it was. Uh, was she praying home. for? Was she praying for protection, or what, she what just the... prayed? But then it's like it almost transformed Sai into a person I couldn't recognize because I <laughs> prepared them. I said, "Another duck call room." They said, "What's this going to be like?" And I said, <laughs> "I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> it's going to be chaos and nonsense." <laughs> Well, while and it, you were a young buck, we took a trip to New Zealand. New Zealand. New Zealand. Took a trip to New Zealand. They Which had, is in the neighborhood of Australia. They had carried ducks over in a, for about 1920. There was a duck hunter uh, president we had. Yep. So they sent some ducks over there, and there's no predators on them. So they really made a deal. But all I, I told you earlier, Al, Jace, you should have been there. Because when I preached the gospel to them, there was a, they said the Brits it cranked it up. They all get together at once when they don't like something. And it was like this. <laughs> murmur, murmur. <laughs> and I said, what is that? And he said, they're speaking against you. They don't, know, they don't like what you're doing. However, after the thing, some of them would walk by, and we had a few duck calls on the table, you know, and they would do this. They would they would look around like that, and then they would tell me, "We appreciate that," but but they they had to do it like like this, and through the internet, they they were a little more bold about we heard your your speech, and mm-hmm. and we 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 we, we are we we're, we're feeling sorry. For the way we treated you, but but that's they've grown some. Y'all saw those people, so maybe it's uh. Well, we're all children of the crown because you know we all were Brits at one point. The Aussies, I'm assuming, the Kiwis in New Zealand and us, and so we were laughing about it because we they were like, you know, we're still fighting the crown. We were like, well, we we left a long time ago. <laughs> I guess that's why we're a lot more bold <laughs> in what we do. Yeah, but that slogan for king and country. I mean, the Brits came up with that to put their lives on the line. Yeah. For king and country, the king and country is a bigger. That, that's a higher that the small bones are referring to. I think they're referring to. I don't think the I know, king, the king of kings. Yes, 
and this yeah. new country that Hebrews 11 discusses. You remember when Abraham, they were looking for a better country. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. A better city. And that's very evident by the movie, which we talked about extensively on the podcast. Uh, the message that I got from that movie was that, Jay's that because they went up from Australia to here, but there's no doubt it was their relationship with Christ that carried the day for them. And I don't know, Dad, you weren't on with us, but it, it reminded me so much of our story in that when you and Mom got Jesus on the throne in your lives, how that changes everything. And I think they went through similar. Well, you know, you look, at, you look at the time frame, it was when these people were here, it's been about, Oh, 25, 30 years since I made that trip. So it's. Oh, uh, it's probably been more than that. Yeah, over 30. Over 30. Since you were there. But, but it, it, I planted a seed at least. <laughs> you did. And uh, I was telling you that there's a, there's a city, one of the major cities in New Zealand is called Christchurch, New Zealand. So, yep. so somebody came through there with some good news message at some point. Yeah. Yep. Or, they, or they wouldn't have named the city that, which is pretty cool. First Peter 2. Nine comes to mind. You're a chosen people, a royal, kingly priesthood, a holy nation for king and country. Yep. Okay. I just thought I'd throw that in. (laughs) So we're in the book of Acts, and I had a story that I didn't share with you that I think goes along, because when you think, well, what does this look like now? You know, we're, I made a point when we had for King and Country on about when Jesus told him in Acts 1-8 that you start here at Jerusalem, you go to Samaria, Judea, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. Mm-hmm. And I think the backwoods of Louisiana and Australia <laughs> fall into that category. Well, they said our backwoods reminded them of their outback, so there you go. And keeping in mind that you remember, I don't know if we've made reference to this. Surely we did. But when Luke started his first writing, he started it saying, this is, I'll read the verse just so I get it accurately. Acts what? This is Luke. Luke 1. 1. one. It's in verse 3. Since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also for me to write an orderly account to you. Yeah, and so he gives this, he's going to carefully investigate who? Jesus, and he's going to give an account. Right. So then when he gets to Acts 1, that's where I was wanting to go. It's it's such a good phraseology, because he says in Acts 1.1, in my former book, Theophilus, because he wrote to Theophilus in Luke, mm-hmm. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. So it gives you the impression. Still got some that, teaching going th- on. This is, this is what's next. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And so I think when you fast forward 2,000 years, you think, well, what is he doing? So I thought I'd tell you the story that happened because there's a lot of principles that are happening in Acts that I saw in this one little conversation in an airport terminal. So if you ever wonder why they call an airport the place you go a terminal, because that's not a good that's not a good a you don't like to be thinking about terminal when you're I think in it means like the end. Like you're at the end of the. So then you're flying from the end. It's like it's just where the this is where the land ends, and you get. I mean, I'm nervous enough about flying without calling it a terminal. Anyway, well, that's, just, an, that's no, it's an interesting thought because I was coming back from South America, so the guy who sat beside me from South America to Atlanta, he said, "Can you open the window?" This is how our conversation started, and uh, <laughs> in the airplane. In the oh, airport, you mean we're, like, we're fixed. I, say, I don't know if you can open the window. <laughs> well, that's exactly yeah. what I said. <laughs> and uh, I said, well. The shade, the shade. In, in a moment of stupidity, I said, now you realize that window's not coming up. <laughs> He's like, no, I have a fear of flying. Of course. And I, then I was, 
looking around for the bag, make yeah. sure he had one. He said, but I've, I've noticed if I can see the ground when we take off, it alleviates my stress. And uh, I said, well, you know what you need? And he said, what's that? I said, you need an emergency landing. And he said, what do you, what do you mean? I was like, well, I used to have a fear of flying. Because I was thinking this is a good opportunity to get in a conversation about Jesus. Yeah. You know? yeah. So I said, I, I just was terrified of flying. And I said, but I was going around the country speaking about Jesus, which is kind of weird because I believe in the resurrection. So I'd already planted the seed right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've declared and unleashed the power that is in the gospel, but I did it in a, oh, by the way. And I said, so here I am doing that, but I have a, a fear of flying. And and I always have of height and, and being claustrophobic. And so it's like yeah. all my fears are coming together in a in a plane. I said, so we used to, back in the day, we were quite busy. And uh, sometimes we'd have to take a private plane. And a guy would lend us his plane sometimes because he was also a believer. So I'm kind of setting the stage here for what I'm involved in. And... Uh, so I said, I have, I'm in the cockpit. He's flying. My wife's in the back. I think I've told this story before. But I'm listening to all the chatter at the air traffic control. And so then all of a sudden, I hear about an emergency landing. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, somebody. I'm it's getting trouble. to listen to all the secrets, you know. <laughs> so when I looked at our pilot, he had turned a different shade of white. <laughs> and really, he looked like he had become ill. And that's when I realized, oh, we're the ones that need an emergency landing because we had just taken off. And so we started turning around. Our fuel pump had gone out in our plane I later because I checked back and tried to figure out later, why, why did we have the emergency landing? And so we just kind of like a, like a ride at a, an amusement park, we just went straight down in a, in a real quick manner and uh but in that time because i thought we're having an emergency landing and as we began to fall you know i just kind of felt a peace come over me which is sh shocking i was sh as shocked as anybody because yeah. i thought well and because i looked back at missy and she looked concerned and she's like is there a problem and i'm like we're fine because i in that moment i just thought you were being a protector. Yeah, I just yeah. didn't want her to stress out. I knew I was fixed to see her again anyway in yeah. some capacity. Because you think, well, it's over. But I thought, this is where it ends. And so what I was so fearful about, I really wasn't scared in the moment. And uh, I I contribute that to the Holy Spirit. And so uh, so I told him that. And <laughs> his response was funny. He's like, Jace, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you will blow smoke. That's no, what I think he was just That's saying exactly what he meant. I know yeah. your story, you know, and he said I am also a believer, but I don't think I need an emergency <laughs> landing. And I said, Oh, I'm going to disagree with you. I think you do. I said, If you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, I said, I don't think it'll be as bad as you think. And I said, I just got over it. So now I get on the plane and no matter what happens, I'm like, here we go. The man just told you he's afraid of flying and you start talking about near misses and crashes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's funny. <laughs> you were like, you were leading him to that place. Well, it <laughs> didn't offend him that much because we talked for four and a half hours. <laughs> that's funny. Let's take a break. So Jay's one of our sponsors, Patriot Mobile. Uh, one of the things we love about them uh, is that they love America, and so do we. I mean, that's a good thing, right? You got the American flag behind you today. Yeah, the idea is if you use their service for cell phones, you you become a mobile patriot. <laughs> patriot Mobile <laughs> supports mobile patriots. That's That could be the new tagline. I like it. Jason has a marketing uh, proclivity. I'll just put it that way. So for 10 years, Patriot Mobile has been America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. Uh, they offer dependable nationwide coverage. Uh, they give you the ability to access all three major networks. And uh, what we love about it is you get great coverage without having to fund the left, which is always good. Uh, when you switch to Patriot Mobile, 
Uh, you're letting everyone know you support free speech, religious liberty, and sanctity of life. They're also big supporters of the Second Amendment, our military, veterans, and first responders. So these guys are great. Um, they have a 100% U.S.-based customer service team that makes switching to Patriot Mobile easy. You can keep your number and your phone, or you can upgrade your phone. They'll help you find the best deals and a plan that fits your needs. Here's what you do. Go to patriotmobile.com slash phil, or you can call them at 972-PATRIOT. You get free activation when you use the offer code phil. So join us. Make the switch today. PatriotMobile.com slash Phil. PatriotMobile.com slash Phil. Or you can call them at 972-PATRIOT. Well, that was not the story I was going to tell. Well, when you said that about Terminal, it popped Well, in. it made me think. Let me, let me just verify this because I did say Terminal was the end of. So the, the, this is the definition of forming or situated at the end or extremity of something. So I think that's the the idea we're talking about. I guess about it's here. like, yeah, now I get it. I guess they were thinking the jumping off place. It was like yesterday, so I went my mom's been in a in a rehab deal getting ready to come home, hopefully soon. And um and she's in good spirits. I know you guys have been praying for her. And uh, she's she's doing great. But uh she come I come in, so you know I've been coming by and seeing her because I'm in town a lot now and so I came by. So I met this guy that's across the hall from her, Mr. Peppers. And he's a funny old guy. And so we talked in the hall. And so I come in yesterday and she says, well, we lost Mr. Peppers uh, yesterday. And I was like, oh, no, I really like that guy. I was like, did something happen during the night or what? And she said, oh, no, he just went home. And I was like, Mom, yeah, the way you put that. when you're staying in a place like this, don't say we lost the guy. Like, I mean, because that either means he wandered off or, or, he, pat- to, or I, he moved well, on, you know. Before I, before I left town, I was warned by three different people, you better go see Kay before you leave. Well, she had already said, she heard you were coming to town. She said, if Zach does not come see me while, while he's in town, then he is anathema. I mean, she so didn't I use did that word, but see, she I said. I did go by and see her, and, and she looked great. She uh, When I walked in, Missy was in there, Jace, and oh. she was eating Missy's meatloaf. Oh, that's a funny story, but go ahead. <laughs> she had meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and a Sonic drink, uh, a Route 44. I don't know what was in it. It was unsweet tea. Yeah, she's getting away I from asked, But Phil, I asked her, how. I said, how's Phil handling you being gone? She said, oh, he's so worried about not getting groceries. I told him to send Dan down there to get the groceries. But she said you <laughs> were worried, worried you're not, not eating, Dan. She's worried you're not eating, Phil. The ace in the hole was the, the man from Jersey Joe. Jersey, Jersey Joe. He's been cooking for Dad. He has been stepping up, Jersey Joe. And that's how calorie to, feed. Uh, converting yeah. to Christ, his wife, the, their children. Yep. And he is a great cook, and he's been supplying me a steady stream yep. of the ta- cooked food Italian ready cooking. to go. Yeah, that's good. So do you want me to tell you the story? Yeah, now tell us the so so, story. So that wasn't the story. That was an interjection of the that story. That was a story to <laughs> introduce the story. This is, this is the real cold open right here. I thought that was the story. Well, one of the keys... <laughs> Jason's stories have stories that set up the stories. Just well, here's that. the way I look at it. <laughs> How I look at it is that we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, come on, and we hey, are hey. making Jesus known. Okay. And one of the ways I feel that people who are disciples of Jesus should do that is to have conversations Agreed. with people along the way day to day and look for opportunities to insert Jesus. I just gave you an example. Mm-hmm. Now, this guy happened to be a believer. Yep. So then I move to the terminal, and I'm, I have a three or four hour layover, which is what that means is podcast study time. <laughs> so I sit down amongst the throng of people, waiting for my gate to change because it always does when you're in Monroe, but it's always in the same little section. Yeah. So I get my Bible out and I'm oblivious to my surroundings and I get deep into the book of Acts. And I, I think at that time we were in chapter 10 talking about the Gentiles, the entrance of the Gentiles, Cornelius, which is yeah. everyone that's not from Israel. So all of you listening that are not from Israel, we're talking about our birthplace here, how this all got started. I'm reading. 
Well, I feel a tap on the shoulder, and I looked up, and there's an elderly woman. She said, excuse me, are you a pastor? Mm. And, you know, in that moment, I'm oblivious to even what I'm doing. I said, well, no. And she just looked puzzled. And then I realized she's watching me studying studying my Bible. Yeah. I said, well, I'm a believer. And she said, really? She said, well, I just got off a plane where there was another guy studying his Bible. And she said, as I look around in this world, I get so depressed and I get angry. And she said, but all of a sudden, in a span of just a few minutes, I see two people studying the Word of God, and I just want to ask you, am I missing something? <laughs> it was quite a question. <laughs> Instead of saying, I'm so glad people were studying, she's like, I'm missing am, I, am I missing something? And I said, well, Jesus is alive. That, that was my response. I was like, I hope you haven't missed that. I was like, this book is about, because I was thinking she was inquiring about you weren't sure whether she knew anything about the Bible, right? Yeah, I guess it was an elderly woman, and, and I just didn't know what she was talking about. I mean, culturally, I'm thinking she's taking an act of courage because she didn't know who I was, tapping me on the shoulder, somebody that looks like me. Most people don't do that if they don't know who I am because they think this old boy looks a little rough, and uh. But when I said Jesus is alive, she was she 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 went in to thank you. She said thank you, Jesus. You know, <laughs> and I thought, well, she she's yeah. All of a sudden, I could tell she she was a believer. Quite. And she was like, she just want to know what you're studying now. That's right. Yeah, I got it. And and she said, uh, it this just warms my soul. She says I don't travel much, but she said I I've just been so depressed about the direction that our world is going. And she gave a speech about families and the breakdown of the family. And she's like in her neighborhood. She said, I'm working from daylight to dark with these kids and because uh, their fathers are not present. And so it just, it wound up being about a three-hour conversation. <laughs> I had no study time. It was a three-hour conversation about what me and her, she was from Virginia, and I said, I'm from Louisiana. And we kind of made a pact with each other to be representatives of Jesus in our culture and, and to try to do something about the breakdown of the family. And we talked about forever families. And, uh, and you know, I can tell you that in that short period of time, she was a sister. Yeah. But to try to describe that to other human beings who don't follow Jesus, it's almost impossible because you thought, what scenario, what discussion, what subject, what do you have in common that you could have that kind of dynamic appear out of nowhere in a terminal at an airport? You would just think that we don't line up culturally. We have nothing in common. We're different colors. And it was amazing how that went. And so she was just looking for revival. And and she saw two people publicly studying the Bible and she thought, now we're talking. Yeah. This and it inspired her, I could tell. Yeah. And look, she I don't know how old she was. She's old. But she had a young, energized spirit about that conversation. And I thought, boy, look out, Virginia. Sometimes we pass along new information uh, to people. Sometimes we pass along old information to people to inspire them, but then sometimes we just validate what people know in their hearts, but then that really lights a fire in people. So that's the beauty of these conversations about the Bible. That's what they do. And so they hit us all in different places. That's why the Bible says about itself that in the Hebrew writer said that it's living and active and like a double-edged sword, it always cuts because the thing about it is we're in different places. That's why, I mean, on this podcast, we've been studying books of the Bible, but I don't know about y'all, but every time we go through a book that I've studied and most of them I've taught before, I learn completely new stuff because I'm in a different place now than I was five years ago, 10 years ago, and certainly yeah. 20 or 30 years ago. Well, that was my point. And look, what came out of that was, because I thought, well, I got no prep time now and it's taken us 
three or four podcasts for me to tell that story because we've had other things going on. But it made me realize that, uh, you know, I make fun of Zach all the time over these uh, big words, the apologetic approach. Yeah. And, and he deserves But it. in all fairness, when you look at the book of Acts, they're, they're not doing that. They're not going into these philosophical arguments. They, they are declaring the same message, which is how God worked out his scheme of redemption through the nation of Israel and brought Jesus, and then he died for their sins and that he was resurrected. And I looked it up. There's 13 different times in the book of Acts where the resurrection is discussed in detail, not counting all the times where they went down and preached the word of God or they preached the gospel. Just specifically, let me explain to you what I said, that Jesus is alive. He, he, you missed him. He, he's alive. And that is the power that is unleashed. So one of our sponsors, Fast Growing Trees, uh, is the largest online nursery in the U.S., they have 10,000 different kinds of plants, over 2 million happy customers. Um, Jace, what do you think about fast-growing trees? Well, every time we discuss this, I think about that story when Jonah was on the beach and the Lord provided a tree that was very fast-growing <laughs> <It was. laughs> to give him some shade. When you need a tree, when you need some shade, that's what you need, right? Uh, that's what these guys do. Uh, they provide trees. It's easy to order online. Um, your plants are shipped directly to your door in one or two days. Lisa and I are in the process of getting some fruit trees that we're going to plant at the southern layer. It's got a 30-day alive and thrive guarantee. They offer free plant consultation uh, for as long as you need it, uh, which we love that. So you don't have to have a lot of space uh, to be able to do this. You just need to um, give these guys a call, check them out. Uh, they'll tell you about the soil type, the landscape design, everything you need to take care of your plants. No green thumb required. We have ordered uh, palm trees from these guys before. They came. They were in great shape. So this spring, they have the best deals online, up to half off of select plants and other deals. And listeners to Unashamed get an additional 15% off their first purchase when using the code UNASHAMED at checkout. That's an additional 15% off at FastGrowingTrees.com using the code UNASHAMED at checkout. FastGrowingTrees.com, use the code UNASHAMED. Offer is valid for a limited time. Terms and conditions may apply. You're exactly right, and even though we're going to start in Acts 12 today, just to give you a little preview, maybe the next podcast we'll get there, on Acts 13, I thought the same thing, Jace, because here was Paul with a completely different background, with a completely different set of circumstances for how he came to Christ, and when he does his first like public sermon that we, re that we I'm sure he had preached before, but that we actually get recorded when Luke recorded it in Acts 13, guess what? It was just like Peter's. In fact, he used some of the same points in some of the same scriptures uh, from the Psalms. And so to your point, it's a, it was just simple truth of what had impacted his life. And yet here these guys were, and they hadn't spent that much time together. We, we've established that when we look here. And yet why did they have the same similar message? Because they have the same Lord. I mean, there's a place to talk about Different translations and different doctrines and, and different things. And, and wonder about what happens after we die. I mean, all, all those things that it people It should are, be less yeah. than 1%. We that's are right. here to declare who Jesus is. That yeah. was God's idea. And that's where the power is. That's what yeah. Romans 1 says. Agreed. For in that is the power of salvation. No, nope, I agree. I like it. Um, so let's get back to Acts 12. Because uh, we've we've kind of false started here about three times in this text. Last time we had Lisa on, we were kind of getting into it, and then we got into this idea about you know why things happen to you, which we talked about quite a bit in a couple of podcasts. But the setting was so the the uh, persecution has ramped up, and I did want to make one point, Jess. You made it real subtle a couple, maybe three podcasts ago. But you, when you said that when when Peter goes to Cornelius. And he goes to Caesarea, and now the Gentiles are welcomed in. This that, that was a seismic shift 
and now how the Jews were going to be preached to and talked to because yep. this this was a big deal. This and so that one of the reasons behind this whole new persecution we read about in Acts twelve, it really came about because of that one event. Because now Herod is using that against Christians and against these leaders. Because it's like, well, these guys are bringing the Gentiles in, so it's not a, it's not be hard to stir up the Jews for the rest of the that's Book of Acts. That's going to be an early departure for him. Exactly, and so that's what's happened. That's what's led into this situation. So we read um, it, it was. I'll just start out verse one. It was about that time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. So that's picked up. And now we've got actually political figures that have stepped into the persecution. This is more than just the Jewish leadership. And it's more now than just a religious argument. This is a, a nationalistic persecution that's going on. And he has the power to kill people. And that was one of the things that didn't happen before. He had James, the brother of John, one of the sons of thunder, put to death with the sword. So now one of the originals is martyred. When he saw that this pleased the Jews... He proceeded to seize Peter also. Now, the implication there is to kill him. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this is going to be, when you combine that with the Passover, we're talking about an eight-day deal here. So he's going to put him in jail. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. And the significance there is normally, if you had even a high um, target, prisoner, four soldiers would normally suffice, but he quadruples that to 16 soldiers guarding one man. This is unheard of. But I think the reason why is because this is the third time Peter's been arrested and both the other times, one, they let him go. The second time, the you know they just got out. They just appeared back in the temple. So he's making sure that's not going to happen, he thinks. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So that's why there's the delay. So Peter was kept in prison during this eight-day stretch, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. This is where we left off last time with this text because we talked about bringing in spiritual warfare because, you know, the, the church— uh, has no means to go, and it's not like today where they're going to protest or they're going to somehow raise an army, but they actually had a greater weapon. That is, they're asking God to do something about Peter's situation. So it says in verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial. So now we're right here. And when this trial goes public, the idea is they're going to kill him right there on the spot. There's no doubt about it. So it, this is the night before Peter's death, Herod thinks. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. So just imagine that two of the 16 soldiers that are guarding him are literally sitting in the cell chained to him, one on either side. And sentries also stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. And so just imagine what that would look like. But Peter is, is sleeping and apparently deeply sleeping because he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Now, remember, there's two guards that are sitting there as well. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. The angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. This whole scene uh, reminds me of like when I get my grandkids up and we have to go somewhere. They're just like zombies. You know, I'm having to say, here, put your clothes on. We got to go. Get you, you know, get dressed here. They passed the first and second guards and then came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. So he literally leads him out of jail, and none of the guards, including the two chained next to him, seem to be none the wiser as to what happens. So let's talk about that aspect of the story, and then we'll go on from there. I mean, because that's an amazing story. and an ama- I, I would call it a supernatural prison break at that's, the highest that's, level. That's, that's what it was. Yeah. 
There's so many things here because you think, well, how come the angel said, get up, do it quickly? Because you would think, well, he, or however you want to gender neutral call yeah. an angel. Yeah. He definitely, if he has the power to make your chains fall off and to open doors without a clicker. And to to mask it where the people sitting right next to you either don't wake up if they were asleep or don't notice what you're doing. So I think it tells you that there are spiritual forces for the good and the evil. That's the only thing that I could think of. That because he's saying, "Come on, I mean, let, let's get out of here." It, it's a but. What is the angel scared of? Right. I would I would presume the spiritual forces of darkness. Because in, it, enact their forces. It's like the evil one, the time when Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. And Hebrews 2, the reason he came is to destroy him who had the, the, who controlled people by their fear of death. You know, I was talking about the plane ride and being afraid of flying. You know, the evil one uses that somehow. And he's been a murderer from the beginning. And in essence, his work in doing that is how Jesus outwitted him by dying on a cross. Because from the evil one's perspective, he thought, took care of that. I mean, that's just what he does. Right. And so I think he should get a lot more blame for the death and mayhem that happens to good Sometimes people. we get to thinking we wouldn't see, our God wouldn't do little things, but he will do little things. That's a good point, Ed. Mm, and listen, know. right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's take another break. Uh, it's been a while since we heard from our good friends at Jace Medical. And just to let you know, it has nothing to do with our Jace. No, but it makes you wonder if at some point in our history, there was a guy watching a little duck show whose name was Jace and said, you know, I need to make a Jace case. That's right. <laughs> Provide antibiotics. Yeah. Maybe. They looked at you and they thought, we need more antibiotics. <laughs> Just like it was back during the pandemic, today we're facing drug and medical supply shortages in the U.S. As of March, there were more than 200 drug shortages here. And it's looking like it may get worse before it gets better. Healthcare experts have pointed to shortages, domestic production, and the Drug Supply Chain Security Act as trends to watch this year. And so we need to check it out. We need to be ready. That's why you should have the Jace case, as Jace mentioned. It provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. So something happens, you can't get your hands on this life-saving medicines. You've already got it when you got the Jace case. All you have to do is fill out a simple form online, and you'll have it there ready in case you need it. There are dozens of add-on options as well, like EpiPens, Ivermectin, uh, which we know is, is needed as well. Jace, Medi Jace Medical is empowering people just like you to be able to take your family's health into your own hands. So check them out today by going to jacemedical.com. Enter the code UNASHAMED at checkout for a discount on your order. That's promo code UNASHAMED at jasemedical.com. That's jacemedical.com. Use the code UNASHAMED. Check them out. Oh, that's a great point, Dad. And then also, because that, look, Luke, for some reason, put in the church was I mean, praying it for It's a big event. He but... put that in before he said the church was praying for it. I mean, in other yeah. words, yeah. God was listening. But, you know, one of the things that that got to me about this, and I think, Jace, you mentioned this before, is that Peter is a man. Remember how he reacted to everything leading up to Jesus' death, including the denials? But he also, he's the one that cut the guy's ear off. And so... I would say I would call him kind of jumpy, you know. And, but and he's grown. He's grown. <laughs> and the reason you know he's grown is because here he is sitting here chained to these two guys the night before they're going to kill him, and he's sleeping so soundly that an angel literally has to punch him in the ribs. He's not quite sure what's going on. It's not like he's sitting there just sweating. and, and to, I mean, he's just like. You know, if it had been you or me. Oh, I mean, I'd be a mess. And man, I look up and I start seeing chains fall off people. I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't think it's a vision. I, I, I'm thinking, no, there's something going it's on happened. here. But he didn't. But it said it wasn't, they, it wasn't that they were praying. It said they were earnestly 
pray. And, yeah, and I looked up word. that word and when you in the with the definition I came up with are the results from sincere and intense conviction. Yeah. So just think about prayers and earnest prayers. So sincere, you're recognizing that God is really alive and powerful in who he is. Yep. And you're convicted of that in an intense way. Yeah. I would think that's a different sort of prayer Plus than God what we do. does oh. away with him. I mean, he, 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 I say he does away with him. Brought him over on the other side. He he did just bring him on over. Oh, he was eventually. Well, he told him. He said he was eventually martyred and knew he was going to be. Jesus had told him. Yeah. Well, that's the point. Is you know, somebody Jason, said they they read where they crucified him upside down. Yeah. Historically, know. that's what's been said. Um, and we even saw that supposedly the place in Rome. You know, they've got a place marked there. I don't know if it was the actual spot, but the, but they claim it is. Well, for ten dollars, it's the spot. <laughs> That's right. So, but you made this the this this idea, this point that Peter, I mean, man, I mean, just to me in this moment, he he steps up and he shines so brightly, just going forward out of this moment, and yet it came about because of this earnest prayer, and it's what I call a. You know, we all pray in different ways, and we're concerned about people. But then there's what I would call a nine one one prayer. Well, it yeah. is where you got something going on, and you're like, you're blood, sweat, and tears over this prayer. You know, That's it's interesting. Uh, they could have these writers, and God through the writers could have made it much clearer than than it is, because you got to remember, Peter was. I mean, he hit the road because you know they picked. In his mind, he said, they picked to kill me. So he got out of there. And that had been only a few years prior. So it's oh, not I like there had been a lot of time. You think, about, you think about the earnest prayer. And if you look at your own life, I think anybody who's walked with Jesus for an extended period of time know this. When I look back at my life, it's been in the moments where where I felt under bondage, maybe of, of some or under attack. And I didn't know where to turn that. It's in those moments of desperation. Probably that's the best way of saying it. It's in the moments of desperation that the most earnest of prayers are lifted to God. And and that's why we we often look back and say, Man, I was so close to God in this period of my life. And that a lot of times that's that's coupled with a, a period of suffering, a period of desperation, because it's in those moments that we do realize like we, we don't have as near as much control as we think we do. And when when you know, even Peter who had these powers from God. I mean, he's in prison. And so it, it, I know this is in some regard, like the church is, they, they, they believe in the promise of God, but they also are living in the reality that they're being persecuted. And, and I think that if you think about churches now, we, we want the blessings of God, but we don't want to pursue God in prayer earnestly because it takes up too much time, or we don't believe it's actually God's answering prayers or whatever. But I would argue that if you want to see this kind of stuff in your own life, this kind of power unfold in your church, you show me a church that will get on their knees and pr- earnestly pray to God for their members, for each other, to Him. That's a church that's going to experience revival. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah, yeah I was going to say the same thing. I think the difference is when you think about the difference in just praying, because look, I've done it before. I've said a prayer because it was time to pray like for the food or whatever. And it was it was without an acknowledgement of this actually being a real heaven open yeah. interaction. It just yeah. came out of my mouth and right. I moved on. I mean it happens all the time. But here, you know, I kind of analyzed this because when you we get to the end of the story, well their prayer is answered and Peter is broken out of jail and is knocking on the door. And they won't open it. And they won't open it because they don't believe it. That's right. And yeah. there's something there, but I, I wanted to say to echo what Zach said, I think part of this earnest prayer is praying to God about what he cares about. And my point is, most of the time, in my own life, you know, I'm praying about what I care about. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. And it may be a small thing or whatever, but 
This is a completely unselfish prayer as a community coming up. Peter's in prison, and they are earnestly with conviction and sincerity praying to God. And look, this is something that God cares about. We're talking about the introduction yeah. of the church and how we are to declare Jesus. And one of their main pillars has been shut down for no good reason. And I think they realize God cares about this. I, I know he cares about this, and we care about this, and there's a love and remember, the purpose of this persecution, back to how this story starts, was to stamp out. Because his thinking was, well, I got one of them, but if I get Peter, if I cut the head off the snake, I've, I'm going to, King Herod thought, I'm going to end the movement. I'm going to do just like all these other movements. Because they've never believed in who Jesus was, but these people did believe. Let's, uh, let's take our last break, and then I want to read the rest of this text. You know, we've got ourselves a merchandise store these days. Merchandise is one of the best ways to get the word out about what we're doing here to other folks. And right now, you can go to unashamedmerch.com, use our special promo code UNASHAMED10, and you're going to get 10% off the total of your order. And Jay, she'll get mugs just like this one, Unashamed with Dad's mug on the mug. See what I did there? I like it. Uh, I ride with King Jesus. On the other side, which is pretty good. Love always protects T-shirts. Uh, the blind mug, we have one there as well. Uh, so check out some of the other fun Blaze Media merchandise like Blaze Heritage, uh, the Patriotic Collection, the Blaze Media Collection, hats, stickers, mugs, sweaters, a lot of stuff, a lot of fun, and it's going to show people what you're into. Head on over to unashamedmerch.com today and use the promo code UNASHAMED10 for 10% off your order. That's a pretty good deal unashamedmerch.com and be sure you use the promo code unashamed10 so you can get 10% off your order. Check them out today. By the way, it's the same thing Saul, uh, Paul, um, you know, when he persecuted the church earlier and killed Stephen, again, oh, we're going to stamp this thing out. No, you, you're not going to stamp it That's out. That's right. You know, and, um, and I, I just I, I want to reiterate the power of prayer in that what Jace just said is is what exactly what Jesus said when he gave us instructions on how to pray. Because what did he say? When you pray, you pray like this and and you say, Our Father who art in heaven, how will be your holy name, thy kingdom come, thy you know, your will be done. Yeah. Where? On earth. Like how? Like it is in heaven. So we're we're praying for the will of God. To be un, to be accomplished on earth is what is what the prayer is supposed to be, and so when we face moments of persecution, uh, social margin, marginalization, because a lot of people say, "Oh, you're not being persecuted like they are in other," and that's true, but persecution comes in a lot of different forms, and in our culture, it comes in the form of of marginalization, being made fun of, being excluded, um, but that's a that's a thing, right? And then even inside, like a church body where there's pain and there's hurt and there's broken families and there's people that are coming in that who have experienced horrible abuses. Um, and there's all of that going on when a church will come around that and, and they're going to, they're going to love on the body and then they're going to pray for God's will to be done. It, you're, we're, we, we ask for the things we want, but at the end of the day, our hands are open and we're saying, but God, it is your will and we don't have the the vantage point that you have to see this. So we're we're earnestly lifting these prayers up. We're expressing our pain. Our brother Peter is in prison. We don't know what's going to happen to him. He's probably going to be killed because we just saw uh, one of our other brothers killed. And Peter's probably going to be killed. And we, we don't know what to do with this guy. God, would you, would you come? Would you save him? But if it is not your will, Lord, would you give us peace? And so you're you're crying up and you're earnestly lifting up these prayers to God. And it's in that type of, of vulnerability that we get to experience the kingdom because you can't explain the explosion of the kingdom in the book of Acts with this going on. Like how why how would it what what would attract people to come into a movement where they could most likely lose their lives? They were certainly going to be socially ostracized and, and marginalized. What do they get from coming into this kingdom? And I think what they get is a authentic, 
tangible, real experience of intimacy with God and with each other that they see in the church. They see that in the church as they earnestly lift up their prayers. So there's something, happens to be something more powerful than everything that they're losing. It's the only thing that explains how in this environment that we're reading about right here, that the church exploded, and now we're a part of that some 2,000 years later. No, and I think you're right. The prayer did more than just accomplish his rescue. It also did something to him, because listen to this next verse, and I love the way this is phrased, and you could you could take this a lot of different ways. Verse 11 says, Then Peter came to himself. Now, this is after the angel leaves him. He realizes that he's awake now fully. And then he says this, this is a really interesting statement. Now I know without a doubt. Let me just stop right there before I go further. This is a man that's been prone to doubting. I mean, that's yeah. fair to say, right? Because of, of what happened for, to him. Now I know without a doubt. So it's more than just I think he was awake in the moment. I think this energized him for the rest of his ministry and life. Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating, meaning his public probably was going to be an ugly display of killing him. And he's like, God had another plan for me. When this had dawned on him, so this is a moment. Peter has a moment here. He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John. This is John Mark, who's also called Mark where many people had gathered and were praying. So here's the people that have been praying for him. And remember, John Mark is kind of like his scribe or his protege, young guy. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed, and she ran back without opening it, which is typical for somebody who's so excited. And she tells everybody, Peter is at the door. And I love this response of the faithful people, Jason. <laughs> You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel, which is an interesting take. But Peter kept on knocking. When they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. So they're yelling, screaming. He described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James, so this is obviously not son of thunder, James. This is James, the leader in the church, the half-brother of Jesus. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said. And then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become what had become of Peter after Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him. He cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. So they got killed over. So they yeah. they wound up dying. Good night. Because the angel Which brought him out. Kind of sad, really. It yes. is. What is your excuse? There was an angel <laughs> from heaven. That's right. That did this. And they didn't even know really what happened. They just all of a sudden, it remi- you know what it well, reminded me? Who knows what they really knew or saw? You know what it reminded me of, Jay? Remember the movie Shawshank Redemption, which is one of my all time favorites? Whenever they go in the cell, and Andy Dufresne is not in the cell. And so the warden is, gets called in. He looks at the guards. He's like, where is he? You know, I mean, he was here when you called Roll, wasn't he? There's his name. Yeah. Well, he's not here now. Did he just fly away? Where did he go? You know, because it was inexplicable. And what they didn't know was there was a hole in the wall behind the poster. Well, he started looking at that. <laughs> Loosely dressed woman on a poster. What about you? Uh, what do you call her? Sissel Bridges? Or yeah. What about you? You got anything? And he throws a rock. It goes through the thing. It reminded me of this moment because here's Herod thinking he's finally got his clutches around Peter. And he's asking these guys, where did he go? Nobody has an answer. He's messing with the wrong bunch. Here. And all he can do is take it out on them, right? Yeah. Exactly. So there's no answer for the deal, which I think is pretty amazing. Are we going to read the last section? Uh, well, we'll save that for the next, because we're, we're almost out. Well, I was just going to say that I think here you see, you know, a thought I had was that there's going to be no surprises when we all stand before God. And to tie this in with prayer, and how many movies do you see where people start writing each other and they've never met, and then one day they meet, and, you know, in the movie world, sometimes we're duped. 
you know, you thought it was somebody. And But these conversations that you're having with God through your prayer life, believing that he is true and that he exists, they start to compound, and, and that's part of your relationship. And so what I mean by there's no surprises, you know, when people use the vision of hell as a deterrent to follow God, they're like, well, how could he be a God of love and, and punish people? And there'll be no surprises because God knows us intimately. Mm-hmm. And in this case, unlike a movie, he knows our heart. And so I think the actual meeting face to face, like Revelation 21 says, there'll be no doubt yeah. of your standing with God. He, he, he knows your heart. And those who don't care about God, there'll be no misunderstanding. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> there, there'll be like, huh, I didn't think you were here. And he's like, I know it. I wish you would have. <laughs> and so I think Peter is galvanized by what happens here for here to the rest of his ministry, even though that's the last time we read about him in the book. Well, I think that's why he was so confident is yeah, what I'm saying. He's like, he rescued... That I know without a doubt. I mean, this is real because I'm sure he prayed, the church yeah. prayed, and it happened. And it happened. And he was prepared either way. So, all right, we're out of time. We'll, uh, we'll pick up the last part of the story in the next Unashamed podcast. We'll see you there. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.